I have more joy in watching my leaders grow and develop than I have in my own personal development. You want to have a mission that's worthy of the calling of the people that you're trying to develop. Mentors must go first. It's our job as leaders to take people to the top of the mountain. That's why we're there. It's not just that we can get to the top, it's that we can bring people to the top with us. Today I would like to talk to you on the subject, developing the leaders around you. What we're going to really do is we're going to talk about how to turn producers into reproducers. You see, the two most important questions that leaders can ask themselves are these. Number one, am I developing my potential as a leader? And number two, am I helping other leaders develop their potential? Now, it's been my experience and my observation that most people, uh, maybe half of the people that are leaders develop their own potential, but what is astounding to me, as I have worked with leaders who are developing other leaders, is that probably only about 5% of the leaders that I know truly develop other leaders. In other words, what I'm really saying to you is this. Most leaders don't develop leaders, they develop followers. And it's never going to happen for you in your organization or my organization if all we do is just have followers going around following us. That's not our goal. And the training series that we're going to deal with today is going to help you to develop other leaders in your life. I want you to note in your uh, workbook that most producers are not reproducers. And I was challenged in 1987 by Peter Drucker. Uh, we, I spent two and a half days with him with about 25 other leaders. And he really challenged me and continually asked me the question, John, uh, who are you reproducing? Who's going to follow you? Uh, what kind of a legacy are you going to leave behind? And I can remember him saying over and over and over again, there is no success without a successor. Back in 1987, I was challenged as a very young leader to say, okay, who am I going to reproduce? Who am I going to pour my life into? Who am I going to develop? Who am I going to train? Who am I going to work with? Who can I bring around me that can truly follow my footsteps? And that was my commitment as a very young leader, clear back in 1987. And it's my goal to share with you reasons why you need to develop other leaders and to probably create within you a passion to develop leaders, train leaders, and have others that can hopefully even maybe rise higher than you are yourself. So let's look at our workbook and let's get together and let's see what we can do to really begin to become reproducers. Why do leaders need to reproduce leaders? Number one, the organization's growth potential is directly related to its personnel potential. In other words, if you're going to grow your organization, you have to grow your people. That's just the way it is. It's the way it always has been. Recently, I was uh, speaking on leadership for Bell South, and uh, before I went up to speak to uh, some of the Bell South leaders, uh, one of their HR people got up and said some wonderful things about people and how that people are the only appreciable asset that that, that organization has. And as I was listening to him very carefully, I thought, wow, he's, he's insightful, he's got it wired right, he understands that you got to put your time and resources in people. But then when I got up to speak, I, I wanted to add just a little of a, of, a, of a caveat onto what he said. And I said, let me say this. People are only an appreciable asset if you're developing them. In other words, people don't develop on their own, just like you and I don't develop on our own. They don't grow on their own. In other words, there has to be a concentrated, strategic effort to really develop people. But when that happens, as you grow your people, you do grow your organization. You see, in my book, the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is the law of explosive growth. And the law of explosive growth says, to add growth, lead followers. But to multiply growth, lead leaders. And I want to encourage you, if you want to multiply your organization, if you want to compound your effectiveness, you've got to pour your life into people that are potential leaders and raise them up. The second reason why leaders need to reproduce leaders is those closest to the leader will determine the success of that leader. Now, you've heard me say that many times. You see, the law of the chain 
which is out of my book, The 17 Indisputable Laws of Teamwork. The law of the chain says the strength of the team is impacted by its weakest link. Let me explain that to you. Let's say in your workbook here, you have five people on your staff, and they happen to all be tens. I mean, they're the very best. And, and wouldn't that be wonderful, huh? But let's say they're all tens. Now, if you took those five people and you kind of looked them and brought them all together, those five tens, that equals 50. But let's say out of the five people you have, you have four tens and you have one person that's average. There are five. Now, all of a sudden, it goes from 50 to 45. You've already reduced your effectiveness 10%. But if you really have five people and you have the synergy that you really want to have that leaders do in a good environment, now all of a sudden it's not addition, it's multiplication. So look, when you take 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, it equals 100,000. So if you have five people synergetically leading and growing together and really reaching their potential, you, you, you have huge return. Now, if you have one person in that group that's average, and so you have four tens and one five, if you multiply that out, it's only 50,000. There's a loss of 50% effectiveness because of the weak link. That's why you and I need to be growing and developing the people around us. Let me give you, for an example, my success journey. In my journey of growing and leading and, and, and trying to develop people and develop organizations and start companies, basically here's how it works with me. When I began many, many, many years ago, in fact, too many years ago, when I began many years ago, my, the first process of my journey was this. I said to myself, I want to make a difference. And I just really worked hard on, on, on working hard. I poured effort, energy into what I was doing because I wanted to make a difference. And it didn't take me long to realize that although I could make a little bit of a difference by myself, I could not make a lot of difference. It's kind of like somebody comes up to me and they'll say, you know, John, I'm a self-made person. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. And whenever they tell me that, I always say, oh, I'm sorry. Because if you've made everything yourself, you haven't made much. And all of a sudden I realized that just doing it myself was not enough. One of my favorite little deals I carry with me all the time is entitled The Indispensable Man. Just listen to this. Sometime when you're feeling important and sometime when your ego's on bloom, sometime when you take for granted that you're the most qualified in the room, sometime when you feel that your going would leave an unfillable hole, just follow this simple instruction and see how it humbles your soul. Take a bucket and fill it with water and put your hand in it up to the wrist, pull it out, and the hole that's remaining is how much you'll really be missed. You may splash all you please when you enter. You can stir up the water galore, but stop and you'll find in a minute that it looks quite the same as before. The moral in this quaint example is to do just the best that you can. Be proud of yourself, but remember, there's no indispensable man. And you and I, doing it ourselves, will not make a big difference. So in my journey, I went from I want to make a difference to secondly, I want to make a difference with people. In other words, I said, okay, if I'm going to really make a difference, i got to bring pre people on my team. And so I brought people on my team. The good news is I began to understand I needed people. The bad news is I brought anybody on the team who wanted to be on the team. And I didn't train them. I didn't develop them. And so now all of a sudden I think that just because I have more people, it's going to get better. Can I tell you something? More people doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It can be more confusing. Your goal isn't more people. And all of a sudden I began to realize this really doesn't work. And so I went from I want to make a difference to I want to make a difference to, with people to number three step, which is I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference. Now all of a sudden what am I doing? I'm bringing people on the team who really want to make a difference. Let me ask you a question. I'll bet this has happened to you. Have you ever had somebody to come on your team and you maybe really asked them to come and you wanted them on the team, but when they got on the team you realized that they really didn't want to work hard, they didn't have the same vision, they didn't have the same passion, and, and they didn't have the same goals. H how many of you have ever brought somebody on the team, when you brought them on the team, they weren't really helping you lift the load? H how come on? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Hit the ball and drag Charlie. Hit the ball and drag Charlie. Hit the ball. After a while, don't you just want to hit Charlie? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> now we all understand that. We all understand that. And what I found is, is it, the goal is just not people. And when I look at some companies, I look at organizations, they say, well, we've hired a, a group of people. My, your, your desire is not just to have people. You've got to help people to get better. Remember, they're the, only your appreciable asset if you really develop them. So I went from I want to make a difference to I want to make a difference with people to I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference. In other words, they have the same passion. They have the same desire. But you know what I found? I even found that some people who want to make a difference perhaps don't have the ability to make the difference. 
And I went to the fourth step, which is I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference and who can make a difference. You see, here's what I discovered. In developing leaders and developing people around you, you have to always consider two things, attitude and ability. And don't ever try to substitute one for the other. In other words, when I said I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference, I was talking about attitude, people who really would like to make a difference. Then one day I realized some people who want to make a difference really don't have the ability to make a difference. Are you with me? So I said, wait a minute, I need, a, I need attitude, but I also need ability. Uh, nothing's worse than having somebody with ability that has a poor attitude, huh? Haven't we seen that before? The good news is they can get the job done. The bad news is who wants to be around them? And nothing is probably more difficult than to have somebody with a great attitude who lacks the ability. In other words, they really want to give it a shot, and you just love working with them, but somehow they just don't have the giftedness and ability to take you to the top. So you've got to have both. So in my journey, I went from I want to make a difference to I want to make a difference with people. I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference. I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference who can make a difference. And when I got there, I thought, I've made it. Eureka. But I haven't made it. There's still one step in this journey. Because, see, see, step number five is going beyond I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference, who can make a difference. Step number five is I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference and who can make a difference, hang on now, doing something that makes a difference. In other words, you want to have a mission that's worthy of the calling of the people that you're trying to develop. That makes all the difference in the world. And I'm very fortunate. I've had the privilege of founding three companies, and I'm extremely fortunate with the people that I have around me, and I'm so excited about who they are and how they help me. But just recently, the book I wrote a few years ago, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, passed the one million mark. And at the Booksellers Convention in Orlando, I was privileged to, to be honored by Thomas Nelson, our publisher, but I was also honored to have some of my key players on the team that helped me uh, get that book to a million in sales. And I think the highlight of my evening is they gave me about 20 minutes of which I stood up and I began to thank the people that really made a difference for me. I went around the room and I began to say thank you so very much. And, and I began to talk to the people and, and share with them how that they really helped me get there. And that night, as my wife Margaret and I, we went back to our hotel room and I said, you know what the highlight for me this evening? They gave me some wonderful gifts and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. I said the highlight for me was the 20 minutes where I was able to say to the people around me, truly, the only reason we ever passed the million mark was because you were on my team. Here's what I know, and listen to me very carefully. Here's what I know beyond any shadow of a doubt. That no one can go as high by themselves as they can with somebody else. It does take teamwork to make the dream work. And you and I, if we're going to go to the level that we really want to go to, we can't do it alone. That's why we try to develop the leaders around us. Okay, there's another reason why you and I want to develop the leaders around us, and then that is number three. Every organization has a shortage of leaders. <laughs> now, you can trust me on this. I have never gone to a company, I've never gone to an organization who said to me, John, let me tell you something, wow, we have too many great leaders in our organization. I'm saying, wow, wow, can you, can you help us thin out some of the great leaders in our organization? We, we just have so many leaders that are taking responsibility and lifting the load and taking people to a higher level. Could you please, could you just, could you just, oh, could you just thin out the leaders? No. Here's what I know about your organization. Here's what I know about mine. No one has enough leaders. The Gallup poll says that when people leave their organization, 65% are actually leaving their managers. In other words, a majority of people are leading because, leaving because the leadership's not good. Peter Drucker said, so much of what we call management consists in making it difficult for people to work. Isn't that the truth? Wow. That's why I teach leadership. See, managers assume everything will stay the same. Leaders assume things will change. Managers are like thermometers. They record the temperature. Leaders are like thermostats. They make the temperature. Now, Leadership in your notes. Leadership is courage to put oneself at risk. Leadership is the courage to be open to new ideas. Leadership is being dissatisfied with current reality. Leadership is taking responsibility 
while others are making excuses. Leadership is seeing the possibilities in a situation while others are seeing the limitations. Leadership is evoking in others the capacity to dream. Leadership is inspiring others with a vision of what they can contribute. Leadership is your heart speaking to the hearts of others. Leadership is the integration of the heart, head, and soul. Leadership is the power of the one made many and the many made one. Leadership is the capacity to care and in caring to liberate ideas, energy, and the capacity of others. Leadership is the willingness to stand out in a crowd. It's the ability to submerge your ego for the sake of what is best. Leadership is above all courageous. Leadership is an open mind and an open heart. Leadership is the dream made flesh. That's a fact. What I have found is that in every organization, if there's a problem, the problem is there are not enough leaders. That's why we're talking about developing leaders around you. My background is pastoring. And many years ago in a large church in San Diego, we decided to begin small groups. And I'll never forget this. I stood in front of a few thousand people and I challenged them to get into small groups and we had them organized and everything was doing very well and we put them in all these small groups. But within about eight to nine months, hundreds of small groups had just kind of dwindled away until we just had a handful. The reason is very simple. I had not trained leaders to lead the small groups. In other words, we just put small groups of people together without training and developing leaders, and I called a timeout. I backed up. I said, hey, big mistake. We're going to spend the next few years developing leaders. And over the next few years, we developed several hundred leaders. And then when we started small groups, within like eight to ten months, we had over 2,000 people in small groups. Why? Because we realized that for anything to be effective, you have to have a leader in that group. Now, I know that sounds simple. But yet I find all the time, especially companies and organizations, do not invest in training people to lead, and they just they invest in maybe having them manage people, but not lead people. And leadership is what takes people to a higher level. Management has kind of a, sometimes a containment idea, but leadership has more of a growing empowerment idea. Number four. Before we do number four, let's review. Why leaders need to reproduce leaders? Number one, the organization's growth potential is directly related to its personnel potential. You cannot grow more than your personnel. Number two, those closest to the leader will determine the success of that leader. Number three, every organization has a shortage of leaders. Number four, leaders attract other leaders. One of the reasons you want to develop leaders in your organization is because what do leaders do? They attract other leaders. So the more leaders you have in your company, the more potential leaders you're going to attract to yourself. You see, here we go. It takes a leader to know a leader. In other words, leaders spot potential leaders. It takes a leader to show a leader because that's the modeling. We'll talk about that later. And finally, it takes a leader to grow a leader. That's why you have to have leaders. How do you develop a leadership environment? You develop a leadership environment by having leaders in it. The law of magnetism says who you are is who you attract. The question is, who are you attracting in your organization? What kind of people are attracted to your organization? You see, every company is like a revolving door. People are coming in, people are going out. People are coming in, people are going out. The question is not are people coming in, people are going out. The question is, who's coming in? Who's going out? If you're bringing in eights and nines, Oh, happy day. And if you're losing ones and two, oh, happy, happy day. <laughs> but if twos and threes are coming in and eights and nines are leaving, huh? We got trouble in River City. So what you have to understand is that you're, all, you're going to attract who you are. So the more good leaders you have, then you're going to begin to develop what I call a, a leadership environment, which will turn into a leadership culture. It starts with a leadership environment, and then it becomes a leadership culture. Because here's what I have found. Tens attract tens. In fact, tens, if, we're, if ten is top, tens, if they could, if they could, they'd, they'd bring in an 11. You know what I'm saying? They'd bring in somebody. T tens attract tens. Nines, they, 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 they attract eights. Uh, they want a little gap here. Sevens, well, they attract fours. And sixes, well, they can attract sometimes twos and ones. Here's what I found in leadership. The lower the leader, 
as far as their capacity, giftedness, and security, the more of a gap they want between themselves and the people that they lead. So if leaders attract leaders, the better quality leader you have, the better quality potential leader you'll attract. Now at the beginning of this session, I said the two most important questions that a leader can ask themselves is, number one, am I developing my potential as a leader? And secondly, obviously, am I developing the potential of others as leaders? In 1973, I was challenged to develop my potential as a leader. And I, at that time, put myself on a personal growth plan so that I could try to reach the potential that I felt God had given me and be the very best leader I possibly could be. Now, that was in 1973. I put myself on a personal growth plan, and every year since then, I have been on one. But it wasn't until 1987, 14 years later, when I turned 40, that I realized that I wasn't developing leaders around me. I had a lot of followers. I had a lot of people helping me. I certainly had a lot of people on my team. I had a lot of people saying, hey, John, good job, and what can we do? And they had a servant's heart. And, and I mean, they were doing work for me. But all of a sudden, I realized I wasn't reaching my potential, and I began to sense a little bit of restlessness and a little bit of kind of depression. I'm saying, oh, this, I, I'm not where I want to be. I'm at the halfway mark, and whoa, I've got a lot of stuff I want to accomplish. In fact, it was out of that, those few days that I, I developed another law of my 21 irrefutable laws of leadership, and that is the law of the inner circle. Those who are closest to you are going to determine the level of your success. And it was, it was then that I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life, 1987, developing leaders. And I want to tell you something. My number one focus isn't writing books. My number one focus isn't speaking for corporations and companies. My number one focus is mentoring and developing and training leaders, and it has paid off and compounded unbelievably. What's the result? I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I say, I st I, I'm still stretching myself. But I'm also seeing my team as they're learning and as they're growing and as they're developing. And let me tell you this. I went through a transition about four years ago where I have more joy in watching my leaders grow and develop than I have in my own personal development. I have more joy in their success than I have in my success. Why? Because all of a sudden I've understood that if you truly pour your life into people, and especially if you truly pour your life into the right people, people with potential, people with giftedness, people with a bent toward leadership, it will begin to multiply, it will begin to compound, it will begin to go to a level until one day you'll say, how did I get here? It's very simple. You got there because you developed the leaders around you. Harvey Firestone said this, the growth and development of people is the highest calling of leadership. I believe what he said. I'm trying to do what he said. And it's my goal to help you develop the leaders around you.